What do you think? Should we start? It's four. Yeah. All right, let's go. <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome uh, to a lo fi game bev, chill, radio chill beast to relax, study, sleep, two coffee emoji. Um, <laughs> I'm Graham, and we're going to be talking about making games for retro consoles, which is awesome. <laughs> Um, so first we're going to talk about uh, what it was like to make games in 1989, which is 30 years ago, um, why you want to make games for the Game Boy, how a Game Boy actually works, and, you know, uh, and uh, then we're going to talk about various development roles um, uh, on a Game Boy game, um, or development roles, modern development roles projected onto a Game Boy game. Um, then we're going to sort of recap everything and then talk about how you can uh, get started making uh, stuff right now. Uh, so first we're going to go back to uh, 89. Um, I know many people probably don't remember 89 or weren't alive in 89. Uh, so let's look at some, some games. What were games like in 1989? Well, okay, so there were a couple of big releases in 89. Uh, Castlevania 3 for the NES um, came out. Uh, DuckTales came out. Uh, the original SimCity came out for DOS. Um, and Prince of Persia for the Apple II. Um, Prince of Persia was actually made by one guy which is pretty insane. Uh, but uh, you can see like they're all kind of like 2D, they're all simple graphics, they're all very restricted palettes. Um, animation is very like choppy and it's, um, it's not nearly the fidelity that we have today. But um, Okay, so uh, we've seen some games like, what were computers kind of like in the 80s? Well, uh, there was stuff like the Amiga 500, the IBM PC, the Sinclair ZX Spectrum, the Commodore 64, and the Mac. Um, and really, these were all like eight or sixteen-bit computers. Um, they all had RAM numbers in sort of the Ks, uh, high Ks, um, not megabytes of RAM, kilobytes of RAM. Um, and stuff like uh, you can see, like the ZX Spectrum and the C64, they don't have monitors. Um, and basically, these were designed to hook up to your TV, your CRT TV. Um, so uh, let's talk about like what game consoles were like in the '80s. So um, if everyone sort of pictures in their mind an 80s game console, you immediately think of this thing, um, which is true. Uh, this actually uh, was kind of old by 89, like it had been out for six years, and to put that in perspective, the PS4 came out six years ago. Um, but it was still super popular. I mean, this the NES sold 62 million units over its life, um, so it was pretty pervasive. There were a lot of games that came out at that point. Um, for the NES. Um, in, the, in 89 though, we saw a few new game consoles, um, notably the Sega Genesis, um, also known as the Master System. This was a 16-bit system um, that had better graphics than the NES, so it was trying to, to one-up Nintendo. Um, this was pre-SNES uh, days. Uh, and this thing, yeah, Game Boy. Uh, so the Game Boy, um, it's funny, when it was in development, people inside of Nintendo called it the Dame game, and Dame is a Japanese word, kind of like lame. Um, because at the time, it was super underpowered. Uh, the screen on it was monochrome, four color. Um, it didn't really have the, the RAM or the processing power of something like um, the, the Genesis. Um, but, uh, and it also didn't have a, a color screen. Like, the Game Gear came out a year later. And that had a color screen, it had 16-bit you know, graphics, it was way faster, it was way cooler, but what this did have is it had really good battery life and it had the Nintendo seal of quality. Um, and if you talk about games in the 80s, you have to talk about the dark ages of the 80s. Um, so coming out of the 70s, there was uh, things like the Atari 2600 and the C64, and there were a lot of um, games that were being made for those consoles that were not licensed by the manufacturer of those consoles. And there was a big legal battle and uh, basically what happened is the, the people who were making bootleg games won, and so there were just this giant flood of these really terrible bootleg games for the Atari and C64 and things like that. And so, you know, as a consumer, you go into, you know, Kmart or whatever, and you'd spend 60 or $80 on a game, and you'd bring it home, and you'd play it, and it's, you know, it's crap. Um, you know, the, the most uh, famous example of this is the E.T. game for the 2600. Um, and the result of this was people stopped adding games, like the game market crashed in the 80s. Um, and so Nintendo came up with the idea of, all right, we're going to slap a seal of quality on every game that ships from the Nintendo uh, platforms. And what that's going to do is it's going to tell the consumer, hey, this game, Nintendo guarantees that this game is worth the money. Um, and so that kind of single-handedly turned around the, the whole game industry in the 80s, and we might not even be here today if that didn't happen. So it's kind of crazy to think about, but um, that was one of the reasons why this was super popular. 
It's also really inexpensive, too. Um, so what was making games like in the 80s, right? Like, there was no Unity, there's no Unreal, there's no Flash. Um, so consoles by themselves are specialized hardware, right? They're, they're extremely specialized for doing exactly what it, they need to do, uh, which is, you know, um, render sprites and play music and do all these things. Um, so they really required specialized hardware to uh, develop for. So something like uh, the NES required this huge box. Um, this is a dev kit for the NES. Um, you see there's a bunch of like ribbon cables coming out of the top of it, and there's switches on the front, and like who knows how the heck this thing works. Um, but you needed like a whole lot of stuff to make a game. Um, you also had to have a really good knowledge of hardware. Um, because these were very specialized pieces of hardware, you had to understand like the really, you know, at least the basics of electrical engineering. Um, and a lot of developers actually made their own tools, like hardware tools, to debug things. Um, so as an example, this is uh, Atari Lynx, which is a handheld from Atari that was not super popular. Um, but you can see the guts of it right there, and then it's attached with a huge web of wires to a couple of breadboards with some LEDs, and then the cartridge is down at the bottom there. And this was actually made by uh, an employee at Atari to debug um, an issue with a, a Lynx game. Um, so uh, game dev in the 80s was very hardware driven. It's very hardware centric. Um, nowadays, literally everything is software. Like even if you're making a console game, you're making it in software, you're shipping it in software. Um, <clears throat> it's even, it's like rare that you would even touch hardware at all. And if you do, it's like stamping out CDs, right? It's not really anywhere near this level. Um, okay, so talking about hardware a little bit more. Um, game consoles uh, generally ran on cartridges um, at that point. Um, and really quick before we get into what a cartridge is, I just want to um, refresh people in case you're um, not familiar with the difference between ROM and RAM is. Um, so ROM is read-only memory. It doesn't require um, constant power to keep the data in it. Um, basically, it comes preloaded with data from the factory that never changes. Um, a RAM chip, on the other hand, is read-write, so you can write stuff to it, you can read stuff to it. Obviously, it's what we, you know, we have in computers today. Um, and uh, the data in a RAM chip is lost when it loses power. Uh, so you need to constantly have it uh, powered to keep the data. Um, so you think of ROM as like a flash uh, hard drive and RAM as, as you know, RAM. Um, so if you look at this cartridge, there's a ROM chip at the top there. That's all of the game data for, uh, for Zelda here. Um, it contains all the code, all the art, all the music, the writing, you know, everything, um, the cutscenes, every, Every single thing in that game is in that one chip. Um, then there's a couple of control chips here that uh, help that ROM chip interact with the console. Uh, but the interesting thing about this is there's actually a battery and a RAM chip in here. And does anyone except for Greg want to tell me <laughs> why that is? Anyone have a guess? Yeah. So that you can save your game. If yes. Your yes, exactly. There's no hard drive. Uh, so you have to save your game somewhere, and so the way you do it is you write data to a RAM chip that is battery backed, uh, so it keeps it powered. Uh, it keeps it powered while you're not uh, playing the game. Um, and these things are so well designed that the batteries for these lasted until like pretty recently. Like you, um, only now are, are the batteries in these old cartridges starting to die out. So it was a really ingenious design. Um, and the nice thing about cartridges too is that you can extend the hardware of the console. So uh, for instance, this is a Super Nintendo cartridge. This is Star Fox, and, um, and the big chip, sort of, uh, big square chip on the right there is a Super FX chip, and that was a um, sort of a, an early GPU. It was designed to do 3D polygonal graphics, which the SNES was not capable of doing on its own. So this is how you were able to like really extend the console and do crazy things, and, like make these really insane games um, that you wouldn't uh, been able be able to do with just a, a software sort of. Uh, so, um, okay, so uh, why are we interested in uh, retro consoles and the Game Boys specifically? Um, so, from my perspective, um, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, constraints obviously breed creativity. So, uh, with these old consoles, there's very severe hardware constraints um, about what you can and can't do. And so, you come up with these really weird and really like off the wall solutions to a lot of things, which are super fun. Um, there's really no like grab an asset store pack and solve all your problems. Like you literally have to solve every single thing yourself. Um, and so it really works that, that part of your brain that's good at like really analyzing a problem and, and digging into it and solving it. 
Um, and I think the most valuable thing um, that you can get out of this is this mindset of like, what's the simplest solution, right? So when you're coming out of the, you know, the 80s and back to reality, um, having this, this in your head is really useful because you're, you tend to solve things in a way that's it's more, um, it's faster to, to implement, it's, you know, it's easier to, to change it and debug it, it's easier to you know, remove it later, um, if you have uh, that mindset going into uh, your game development. So I think it's super useful to do, um, even as a, just a hobby for fun. Um, okay, so yes, and some other benefits, you know, you understand computer hardware better. Um, it can be an effective prototyping tool. I kind of say can. Um, I think something like a Pico 8 is um, better for that because it has a lot of the same constraints, but not a lot of the same limitations that uh, older consoles have. Um, for instance, Celeste was prototyped on Pico 8. Um, and yeah, all the tool chain emulators for all the things I'm going to talk about are all free, free and open source, so, and they run on literally every computer. Like, it's crazy. Um, also, you know, it's just cool, man. Like, I mean, look at Greg, he's so happy. That's a Game Boy data sheet. He's like insanely happy to make Game Boy games. Um, it's awesome. Also, you know, D-makes are like super cool and super in these days. Like, that's Left 4 Dead. This one's TF2, like, this is so cool. Does anyone know what this is? Mario? Nope. Portal. Portal, yeah. Portal for the 2600. Like, could, like that's insane. Um, here's Witness, which is a NES remake of The Witness. Like, what is this? This is insane. Like, it even has the puzzles, and there's even the, the dot puzzles, and it's crazy. Um, and even uh, game developers these days are making demakes of their own games. So this is... Uh, ROM City Rampage, which is a uh, Retro City Rampage for the Nintendo, uh, the NES. Um, so yeah, it's just, a, it's just a whole lot of fun to make this stuff, you know. Um, so why the Game Boy uh, specifically, and why the original Game Boy, um, of all the Game Boys? Well, uh, I will argue that it's one of the most uh, popular and prolific single computers ever made. And the reason for that is Nintendo was a stickler for backwards compatibility. So you can take your uh, 1989 circa Tetris cartridge for the original Game Boy and throw it in your 2008 Game Boy Advance SP and it'll play just fine. Um, and the reason for that is that as technology progressed, they were able to take the guts of the original uh, uh, Game Boy and shrink it down and shove it in every single Game Boy that was made after that. So if you buy a Game Boy Advance SP, it has the same circuit board as a Game Boy, but just miniaturized. Um, so when you plug in that cartridge, there's a hardware switch that figures out, oh, is this an original Game Boy game? If it is, it uses this old um, hardware, otherwise it uses the normal uh, Game Boy Advance hardware. So, <coughs> uh, so because of that, um, if you add all these things up, there's 200 million Game Boys that could run an original Game Boy game, uh, which is pretty insane. Like, we're talking about 65 million uh, NES units. Like, that's a pretty big number, but 200. So it's super easy to find these. Um, the Game Boy also marked the end of the 8-bit era. Um, it was sort of came out right before the like Super Nintendo and the Genesis and all these like next-gen consoles. Remember, it was called the Dame game internally. Um, and because of that, it sort of has all of the uh, kinks ironed out for the 8-bit consoles uh, of that era. So you don't get a lot of the uh, the mistakes that people made um, uh, early in, in the 80s with 8-bit consoles. Um, and you also don't get any of the experimentation or the complexity of the new 16-bit uh, stuff from that era. Um, so working with this, is, it feels very streamlined. Like, it's really easy to program stuff. It's all memory mapped I.O. Um, there's no weird restrictions about what you can and can't do for the most part. Like, for instance, like the NES can only scroll in one direction. It can do horizontal or vertical, but it can't do both. So like, there's no stuff like that that you really have to like think about. Um, uh, you don't have to chase CRT scan lines like 70s consoles. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's really nice. Um, yeah, they're easy to find, they're reasonably priced. Uh, you can get SD cards, uh, SD card cartridges. Um, so you just like throw a ROM on there, throw it in the Game Boy, and you're good. Like it's super easy to develop for. Um, okay, so uh, how does a Game Boy actually work? Um, so here's a bunch of stats about it. You know, it's got a crappy four color screen that refreshes at 60 hertz. Um, 2 megahertz CPU, uh, 8 kibibytes of RAM, so it's 8192 bytes uh, of RAM and video RAM. Um, there's sort of like a, a weird precursor to a GPU in there. It's a graphics coprocessor. Eight buttons, uh, one mono speaker, stereo uh, headphones, and a link cable to talk uh, between two Game Boys. Um, just uh, 
to put that in perspective, uh, this computer has 2 million times more RAM, and the RAM runs 2,000 times faster. Um, OK, so this is uh, what the Game Boy hardware looks like. Um, so I'll zoom in a little bit. There's basically the only thing I wanted to point out. There's uh, three big chips here. The one on the left says DMG CPU. Obviously, that's the processor. Um, and then the two on the right are the two uh, RAM and video RAM chips. Um, OK, cool. So when you turn on a Game Boy, what actually happens? Like, wh like how does this stuff work? So uh, the hardware in the Game Boy um, does a quick checksum to make sure your, your uh, cartridge is legit. Um, and then this Nintendo logo slides down. Um, and then basically, you have complete control over the entire hardware, right? So your, your cartridge just runs. Like you don't, there's no operating system to interact with. There's no libraries. There's, you just, you're talking directly to the hardware. Um, and you can do anything, really. Um, so the checksum part is kind of interesting. It's, uh, remember I was saying like uh, back in the 80s, uh, people were making bootleg games. And Nintendo didn't want to let that happen for the Game Boy. So, um, it checks that the Nintendo logo exists as the start of your uh, ROM cartridge. And the reason it does that is because um, if you put the Nintendo logo in a bootleg game, it's trademark infringement. So they can sue you off over that and shut you down. So it's pretty ingenious. But <laughs> Okay, so if you're actually making a Game Boy game, what does it look like from uh, modern development games? So art is probably the biggest one, so let's talk about that first. Um, yeah, there's four bad shades of green. Uh, the sprites are 8x8 uh, pixels. Um, the uh, uh, sprites can be flipped horizontally or vertically. Uh, they can't be rotated or scaled at all. Like, there's none of that in the Game Boy. Um, everything is fixed size. Um, the background is 32 by 32 tiles. Uh, but if you do the math in your head, you're like 8 times 32. That's bigger than the actual screen. So there's like this concept of camera that moves around the background. Um, and that's 20 by 18 tiles. So you can have sort of scrolling worlds uh, that way. Um, you can have 40 sprites, uh, but you can only render 10 per line, per pixel line. Um, just a weird hardware restriction uh, without getting flicker. Um, but that's quite a lot of sprites. It's way more than stuff like the NES had. Um, and yeah, so when you're, when you're creating art, you're really working uh, with two things. You're working with uh, tiles, and you're working with uh, tile maps. Um, so tiles end up being your sprites and your background and everything is, is made up of tiles. And then tile maps are which tiles are used in a background. Uh, so this is how you uh, work with uh, tiles. Um, this is a tool called the Game Boy Tile Designer. It's free open source. Um, you can see uh, it's, you know, you're editing an 8x8 tile here, um, pixel by pixel. This is actually a Game Boy Color tile, so just ignore the colors, but it's exactly the same for a regular Game Boy. Um, the palette is at the bottom here, one, two, th zero, one, two, three. Um, it shows you what the uh, sprite looks like and then what it looks like tiled uh, there. And so you can see like, you're like building up this, this palette of tiles on the right here. Um, it's like tile set. Um, so this is very familiar if you've done um, 2D pixel art games. Um, it's the same process. Um, same thing for the uh, map editor. So this is, um, you get the same, uh, uh, tile set on the right here, and you're uh, laying them out um, in a tile map. So it's it's saying, okay, this is, you know, these three tiles are um, tile four from this tile map. Uh, okay, so this is um, this is BGB. BGB is a really awesome emulator that lets you look at the hardware of the Game Boy and like see what's actually happening inside of it. Um, so here's a uh, Zelda game, and you can see the, uh, the, this is what the background map looks like in memory. Um, so there's some like garbage on the right and the left, and that's sort of like left over from the cutscene that played before this scene. But um, you can see like the whole background for this room is in the top left. Uh, so, and it's really hard to see on the projector, but there is actually a little like rectangle that it draws around that room, and that's to, to indicate where the camera bounds are which I was, remember I mentioned before, is it lets you move around. Um, here's what the uh, tiles look like for the scene. So these are all the tiles that are loaded. Um, the reason why they're half black and white and half color, I'll explain in a second. Again, this is a Game Boy Color game, so it's a little bit different, but it's, it's basically exactly the same. It's just nicer to look at. Um, so yeah, you can see like in the, the tile I have selected right now is the bottom left portion of one of those pots. Um, so these are the sprites. Um, Nintendo likes to call them objects. 
Um, and they're sort of the dynamic things that move around that aren't access aligned to a grid. Um, or they are access aligned, but they're not aligned to the grid. So, uh, you know, you have uh, Zelda here and you have some of the other characters, some of the more dynamic things, like there's some, I think those are bed sheets in the middle or something. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but this emulator is really cool because it shows you where exactly it is in the scene, where it's being rendered, um, and all the stats about them, what are the attributes there. Um, so whether it's horizontally, vertically flipped, all that stuff. Um, and then color palettes. So uh, Game, Boy ga Game Boy Color Games uses a lot more, but uh, original Game Boy games have a color palette as well. Um, and so that allows you to do things like um, fading to black. Um, so it's really a matter of choosing like, okay, uh, for this tile, um, you know, the first four pixels are color one and the second four pixels are you know, color two. What are, what are, what's color one and color two um, actually mean? And so that's what a palette would be in the original Game Boy. Um, Game Boy Color obviously makes a lot more sense from a modern perspective, but the hardware is a little bit more complicated. So I'm just showing this as an example, um, it's a lot simpler for the original. Um, yeah, so color palettes. So you can see there's two different types. There's uh, a column on the left, which is all the background colors, and a column on the right, which is all of the object colors. This is OBJ0 through OBJ7, um, so all the sprite colors. So you can have the same tile used for the background and for the um, for sprites if you wanted to, and just swap palettes. Um, the most well-known example I think of this is the the bushes and the clouds in Super Mario are actually the same sprite, they're just palette shifted. So uh, quickly, this is sort of the sprite attributes. Um, so you have an XY position. Uh, the tile number tells you what tile this is. Um, priority is a way to say, OK, if this is rendering here, I want it to be above. You know, I want it to be higher priority so it's above other sprites or below other sprites. Or you, know, you can do even crazy stuff like put it behind the background if you have some, some weird reason to do that. Um, yeah, and flip X, flip Y, um, and then which palette you're using for it. Okay, so animation. Um, it's pretty straightforward. It's all flipbooks. Uh, it's all frame count based, and you got to do it by hand. That's it. <laughs> so you can see, like, like, you can do a lot of tricks, like, okay, Mario running, he starts out that way, and then he swaps between these two sprites every couple of frames. Okay, so writing, it seems kind of weird to go into writing, but it makes sense uh, because writing is just uh, a you know, context specific art, right? So it's all bitmap fonts, so every single character that you're writing is a sprite or a tile. Um, and remember, we have a 20 by 18 screen, so you can only have like 20 characters wide. Um, and that's not including something like a border if you wanted to do that. Um, so you really, your, your dialogue and your, your writing in, in uh, these retro games you really have to be very concise, very short, um, and generally they have a lot of pagination to them, um, just out of necessity. Um, but uh, yeah, so every character counts. Um, actually, every unique character counts too. So if you have a semicolon like six paragraphs into your game dialogue, it's like you gotta have a sprite for a semicolon, right? So you gotta argue with the, the art people to, you know, I need an extra sprite for a semicolon. And then they'll say, you don't use a semicolon. But um, yeah, so there's a lot of interesting challenges like that. Like, um, yeah, so uh, sound and music. Uh, so the way, the way this stuff works on the Game Boy is um, you're essentially programming a synthesizer. Um, there's four voices, one of them is only noise. There's two different ways you can, two different um, bit rates for the noise. Um, one of them is the, the main music one, it's the PCM wave channel. So you can specify, specify a 32 um, sample four bit uh, PCM, like wave, wave table, waveform. Um, and then there are these two pulse channels. Um, and one of them has a frequency sweep, sweep, so it's usually done for sound effects. Um, and yeah. And then the, the weird thing about doing this uh, with just four voices is you have to sort of balance between like, okay, I want two voices for music, but I need two voices for sound effects and all these things. So you, you have to sort of do mental gymnastics to figure out what you can and can't do with the, with the sound. Um, and yeah, and the Game Boys use a lot of chiptunes. Um, there's a, actually a ROM called Little Sound DJ, which lets you, uh, uh, mess around with this stuff pretty pretty easily, um, and it's sort of like a little music sequencer. That's pretty cool. Um, okay, so programming. This is probably the big one um, that everyone's scared about. Uh, so it's assembly or C. And I put C with an asterisk, asterisk there because uh, 
Um, the C compiler support is kind of buggy. Um, you can't really debug it in the same way you can debug C normally. Um, and so you really should just do it in assembly. But assembly is not that scary. It's, you know, it is what it is. Um, but yeah, there's no game engines, no operating system, there's no file system. Um, there's only addition and subtraction. There's no multiplication or division. Um, with a caveat there, you can do multiplication and division by two with shifts, bit shifts. Um, so you think about something like Mario, and it's like, okay, it's projectile motion. Okay, it's, you know, velocity, acceleration. Oh wait, I can't do math. I can't do multiplication or division. So how do you like do projectile motion? And so you're, you're really decomposing these problems in your head. And it's like, okay, well, I'm adding stuff, I'm adding less and less, and then I'm subtracting stuff. And so you, you have to structure your code around really, really simple operations like that, which is really interesting problem to solve. Like you're never gonna solve that in Unity. Like what, you just multiply, right? Um, there's no floating point. Uh, so it's ins ins all day, ins all the way down. Um, yeah, assembly is not difficult. It's just, it's tedious, right? Uh, it's really easy to learn. Like, I learned it in a weekend. I learned it in, like, half a day, basically. Like, and I'm not saying that to brag. Like, you can literally learn, learn it in half a day. It's way simpler than anything you're going to learn. Uh, way simpler than C-sharp and, and all that stuff. Um, it gives you a lot of perspective on uh, other languages um, and what they're actually, like, because everything comes down to assembly, right? So, or, or machine code, which is essentially um, the same. So it, it gives you a lot of perspective on, like, what the language is actually doing for you. Um, it makes you a better programmer, I think. Like you have a lot more of a perspective on performance and um, efficiency with uh, the experience in doing things like this. Um, so just to show you a quick code snippet so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, this is memcopy. It's the, exactly the same as C, the C version of memcopy. Um, it's not that scary. Like if you really go through it, it's like, okay, we're reading some data from the source and incre incrementing the source pointer. We're writing it to the destination, we're incrementing the destination pointer, and then we're taking the uh, number of bytes to copy and subtracting one, and then we're checking if it's zero, and if it's zero, we loop, and if it's not zero, or if it's zero, we, we return, and if it's not zero, we loop. I mean, it's like, it's pretty straightforward stuff if you really dig into it, but it's, it seems really unapproachable at first. Um, it's really not. You can do it. Uh, so debugging. Debugging looks like this. Um, the B2B has a great debugger. Um, you can output uh, symbols, so you get the labels in there. It says memcopy. If you look, it's exactly the same. Like, it's the machine code and the assembly are, are identical, right? So you can see the instruction over there. Um, in fact, if I put the code next to it, um, the only thing that's different is that first one, only because reasons I won't go into. But yeah, you can just, it's one-to-one -one mapping. You can see exactly what's happening. You can debug through things. The top right shows you all the status of the CPU. You can read every memory address. You can write every memory address. Like, you can do data breakpoints. Like, I've, I've programmed in Flash IDs that had less features than this. Like, it's crazy. Um, so it's not that bad. Uh, so wrapping up, uh, since we're almost out of time. Uh, so yeah, constraints, brief creativity. Um, yeah. It's like, what are you really trying to solve here? Like, this is this super cool mindset you get into when you're working in these super old hardware. Um, and if you listen to, like, Mike Acton talked about data-oriented design or any of these things, uh, as a programmer, that's really what he's getting down to. Is like, okay, let's think about the actual problem. Like, projectile motion, what am I actually trying to solve here? I'm just, you know, augmenting the Y value of something by some weird, you know, adding a little bit, subtracting a little bit. Uh, and so you get, this, this into this mindset of like, what's the simplest solution, um, which I, I would say is, is a really, really, really valuable uh, thing to have in game development. Um, yeah, Game Boy again, streamlined hardware, easy to find, uh, good tools, um, good community. Um, oh yeah, and it's 30 years old this year, so hey. Um, so how do you get started doing this? Um, so I'll leave this up, this is, these are the three, top three ways, uh, I would say. This uh, talk by Michelle Style um, is really, really, really good. It's also pretty technical, so it's good for programmers. Um, you can kind of gloss over some of the details if you're not a programmer, but um, it goes into literally everything about the Game Boy. Um, the awesome Game Boy Dev page is great because it has lots of links to different tutorials and different libraries and different uh, code samples and that sort of thing. And then there's this uh, Game Boy Homebrew Discord, um, which is actually pretty active, and there are a lot of people making some really insane things like uh, recently I saw some guy making uh, this really polished like game of life in uh, the Game Boy which sounds kind of simple but it looks really really cool so and that's me and I'll tweet these links after uh, after the talk so uh, thank you I guess we'll do questions real quick sure.
Anybody? Yeah. I'm looking at a game that just has a lot of art assets. So I'm thinking about pixel art. Can you speak to if that really does save space or, I mean, can you speak to using pixel art instead of other art? In modern games or modern in games. modern games? Um, it really depends. Like, uh, it depends on what kind of pixel art you're talking about, right? Because you're talking about like, like super chunky like Mario style. You're talking like Owlboy. You're talking about, like. Like I'd be fine using the Game Boy art yeah. sprites, but having the game depth be so much greater. You could do eight by eight sprites um, and just blow them up really big, um, and then they'd be super small. Like a Game Boy ROM is smaller than the screenshot of a Game Boy ROM, so like they're pretty efficient. Um, but in terms of like. Yeah, I mean, it really depends on what game you're making and what the style you're going for is. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I use a, a card called the EverDrive. Um, yeah, and I use a micro SD card, so you just throw the wrong file on there and it boots up and runs it, so it's pretty cool. Do you need hardware to get started? No, uh, you can use the BGP emulator. Um, it's, uh, it runs on my computer in Wine, it works on Windows, you can hook up a game controller to it and just go from there. Yeah. When you said he's making a game of life, do you mean like a third game of life? Like Conway's game of life. The what? Conway's life. Oh, okay. Yeah. That was great. Thank you. Cool, yeah. Also, curious question, pixel art. Essentially, 